Hi folks, Mr. Ackerman here. Thanks for watching. The topic of today's video is projectile motion. And uh, with the book that we're using, Physics 11 by Addison Wesley, there is not actually a section on projectile motion. So what you're going to learn will come from what you see in this video, as well as some of the exercises in the course pack, and also any uh, online resources that you choose to hunt down and use. I'll mention uh, at least one in this video, and of course there are many out there. So in a moment I'm just going to ask you to pause the video, have a look at the questions that we're going to address in today's video, as well as take a look at the unit schedule to see where we're at, and also the learning goals and success criteria. All right, pause the video, please do that now. Okay, and you're back. We're going to dive right into things. First, I'd like to answer the question, what is and what is not a projectile? So I have in front of you six images of objects that are uh, not on the ground. They are, uh, or in some cases, they may be on the ground, but are about to be airborne. And I'd like you to just pause the video for a second and try to identify which, if any, of these pictures represent projectiles. Is the skier a projectile? Is the airplane a projectile? Is the ball down here, which is about to be kicked by the soccer player, a projectile? The rocket ship blasting off, the same rocket ship out in space orbiting Earth, and the basketball that's about to be thrown toward the net. All right, pause the video, try to identify which ones are and which are not projectiles. Okay, and you're back, and I hope you've made your choices, and hopefully you have some sort of reason. Now I'm going to tell you, according to physics definitions, which ones are projectiles. So let's put a little check mark beside the ones that are. Uh, the skier going through the air here off of a jump is a projectile. The airplane flying through the air as you see it is not a projectile. The ball that's going to be kicked, and after it's kicked you're going to see it do something like that, is a projectile. The rocket ship blasting off is not a projectile. But the very same ship, once it's in orbit and its engines, as you can see, are turned off, is a projectile. So is the satellite that it's uh, going up here to work on. And the basketball that's about to be launched through the air, much like the soccer ball in one of the earlier examples, this one is also a projectile. So now, uh, think about what you got right, what you got wrong. If you made any mistakes, pause the video and try to reconcile those errors with what I've just told you. And uh, if you also, if you made mistakes, or even if you didn't, see if you can figure out what is the definition of a projectile. Pause the video and think about that now. Okay, and you're back, and let's see if we can figure out why these check marks represent projectiles. First of all, uh, it may actually help to notice that when the skier goes through the air, gravity is affecting him. When the airplane flies through the sky, gravity affects it. In fact, gravity affects all of these objects. You may think that there's no gravity here because they are, quote, out in space. But keep in mind, things that orbit Earth, the reason they're orbiting is because Earth's gravity is pulling them into orbit. So there is gravity in space. All of these involve gravity. You can't say that a projectile is determined by whether or not there's gravity. Let's look a little closer. This guy, who is a projectile, is flying through the air all by himself. The airplane, on the other hand, has engines. And the engines produce what's called thrust, which forces the airplane forward. There's a little bit of force there, isn't there? Also, airplanes have wings, and wings, if you know a little bit about airplanes, just like with birds, those are what produce what we call lift. And of course, airplanes go so fast that there's a lot of wind resistance or drag. This is a backward force that serves to slow down the airplane. We call that drag or air resistance. That should give you a hint about why the airplane is not a projectile. Let me give you one more that is not a projectile, the rocket ship. The rocket ship is, of course, being forced upward because of what we call thrust, the thrust of the engines. And, of course, there's going to be a lot of air resistance or drag because these things move very fast. And drag, of course, will serve to slow down the rocket ship. Uh, Going back to the airplane, I should mention, there is, of course, gravity pulling down, just like there's gravity acting on the skier here. The ball that's about to launch through the air has gravity. Same with the ball over here. I'll just put the letter G there. And, of course, as we mentioned, gravity is pulling the ship and the satellite down toward the center of Earth. 
So gravity is acting in all six. That doesn't help to identify a projectile at the moment. What does help is that in each of these situations that have check marks, there is very little air resistance. If you're skiing off a jump, there's some air resistance, but not a heck of a lot. And there's really not any other force to talk about. For a ball going through the air, now I'm going to lie to you a little bit here and say there's no air resistance. That's not true. In fact, there's a significant amount of air resistance. That's what can cause the ball to curve if you've ever watched a corner kick in a soccer game. However, we could pretend, if we're just starting to learn about projectiles, that the air resistance or the drag, we could neglect it. And if we neglect drag, then yes, the soccer ball will behave like a projectile. In fact, they very nearly behave like projectiles in many cases. Out here in space, no air, so no air resistance, just gravity. And of course, the ball here is kind of like the skier here, very little drag, mainly just gravity. And so if you're starting to see what are the things that make things a projectile, it's having just gravity that makes an object going through the sky a projectile. Once you add in other forces like lift or thrust or drag or th something like that, you are no longer dealing with a projectile. And that's really just it. An object is a projectile if only gravity is acting on it as it flies through the air. Then you have a projectile. Some books will tell you that it means there is no propulsion system attached to the object. So an airplane has its own propulsion system. It is not a projectile. That's the force that we talked about here. The rocket ship, when it's blasting off, same thing. All right. But all these other objects, once they are launched, like once this ball is launched, there's nothing propelling it anymore. Once the ball is kicked, there's nothing propelling it. Once the jump directs the skier up, nothing more propelling it. And once a spaceship gets into orbit and turns off its engines, nothing propelling it, just the Earth's gravity to keep it going along. All right, let's move on. Um, sorry, before I go to the next slide, I want to pose a question for you. So sit back and listen. Here's the question. If a bullet was fired out of a gun, of course, it would be flying through the air. Bullets don't have a, pr a propulsion system. Therefore, they would be considered projectiles. They only are affected by gravity. Well, of course, there's a bit of wind resistance, but we'll ignore that for now. So imagine this. You've got a gun, and you're going to fire the gun horizontally. In other words, you're going to hold it straight out in front of you and shoot parallel to the ground. At the exact same moment that you fire the gun, a partner of yours is going to drop a bullet out of her hand from the exact same height as the gun. My question to you is, which bullet hits the ground first? The bullet fired out of the gun or the bullet that's dropped by your friend? Remember, they're dropped from the same height and the gun is pointed purely horizontally. Which one hits the ground first? Pause the video, think about it, and come back with an answer. Okay, and you're back. Hopefully you have an answer. Uh, I guess you could have answered one of three things. You could have said that the fired out of a gun bullet hits first, or you could have said that the dropped bullet hits first, or you could have said that they hit at the same time. Which one is it? Does the forward motion of the fired bullet keep the bullet in the air longer than the dropped bullet? Well, let's find out. The Mythbusters, if you remember those guys from TV, did an experiment to test this. Here's what the video link is on YouTube. It's called Mythbusters Bullet Fired Dropped. They have rigged up a contraption to shoot a bullet horizontally and also to drop a bullet at the exact same time. It's about three minutes long. Go to this link, check it out, and find out the answer. Okay, and now that you're back, you know the answer. The answer is that they both hit at essentially the same time, which might be surprising to some of you. A lot of people think that the bullet that was shot out of the gun somehow remains in the air longer, but it doesn't. In fact, here's a photograph which helps show you this in a little bit slower motion than what the Mythbusters had. Here's a picture of two objects. One of them dropped vertically downward, that would be the dropped bullet, and one of them fired horizontally, that would be like the bullet fired out of the gun. I've uh, added in some white lines to help you judge the motion of the object as it goes. And let's compare the two. What do we know about the motion of these projectiles? Well, for one thing, if you follow these guys as they're falling, it seems that 
if I draw white lines to sort of track the motion of the objects, it doesn't seem to matter whether the ball is dropped down or whether it's fired out. The vertical motion, they keep pace with one another. In other words, you and I both know that when you drop a ball, we have 9.8 meters per second squared down as the acceleration. The fact that the yellow ball is doing this means that the yellow ball also has 9.8 meters per second squared down. The vertical acceleration is not influenced by the fact that this yellow ball was shot horizontally. What else do we notice? The horizontal motion, as indicated by these vertical lines here, are equally spaced. If I draw how far the ball is moving in these time frames that are indicated by the photographs, you'll see that they're the same, which tells you that the horizontal motion of the yellow ball is at a constant rate. Now, uh, sometimes I get a little bit ahead of myself and I just am realizing that I've done so. What I should have told you is how this photograph was produced because that'll help you to analyze what's going on. This is not a whole bunch of red and yellow balls being dropped. It's actually one ball in a very dark room with a black background. And the reason there's so many images is in the time that the camera was taking the picture, a light was flashing on and off many times per second and it illuminated the path of the ball as it fell and as this one was projected. So this is like a strobe light that you might see at a school dance, for example, in a really dark room. You get to see where the object is at regular intervals. Because you see what's happening here, and I should add in a few more white lines just to make it clear. There we go, there's one. What you can see is that if these flashes happen at regular intervals, then the vertical motion indicated by the vertical lines it is beginning to space out a lot more down here toward the end compared with at the beginning where the spacing was very small. So that tells you that we have acceleration in the vertical direction. The same kind of flashing tells you that in the horizontal direction these equal intervals of progress tell you that the, cor the constant rate is, we have a constant rate in the horizontal direction. Constant rate, constant velocity. So I hope that makes a little bit more sense. Okay, uh, what does this all tell us? If a dropped ball we know accelerates at 9.8, because we learned that in class, and if that's what you're seeing in the yellow ball in terms of its vertical progress, then this is telling you that the yellow ball also has the 9.8 meter per second squared acceleration downward, and that should tell you why the Mythbusters video had the bullet that was dropped hitting the ground at the same time as the bullet that was fired. They both start off initially not moving in the Y or the vertical direction, and then they pick up speed at the same rate. That's why they hit the ground at the same time. Of course, one of the balls, the yellow one, lands a further distance along. We have a name for this. We call this the horizontal range. And that, of course, is the big difference between the two types of motion, that one has a horizontal range and the other one doesn't. So what does that tell us about the path of a projectile? Well, if you think back to one of your kinematic equations, you have a kinematic equation for acceleration. It looks like this. Delta D equals V1 delta T plus a half AT squared. Of course, there's vector symbols there too. Now, for a dropped object, V1 is zero. So we can actually take this term and delete it, and get rid of it, because it's going to have zero times delta T. That leaves us with A, which we know is 9.8 times the time squared. A variable equals a number times a variable squared. This should remind you of a formula from math class. Y equals a number a constant, times x squared. These are really the same formula. And what shape does this give us? Well, of course, it's a parabola. 
So next time you're watching a projectile and you're wondering what shape is its path, which I'm drawing in right now, remember that it's a parabola for this reason. And furthermore, while we're on the topic, if we want to talk about the velocity, there's actually two types of velocities we need to talk about. The first velocity is the one that tells us that the ball is moving horizontally at a certain rate. We call that the horizontal velocity. But there's also the fact that the ball is falling down, and we call that the vertical velocity. You're going to see in a moment that this is labeled v in the x direction, x as in math class where you put your x and y grid like this. So vx is the horizontal velocity, and vy is what's called the vertical velocity. We know that the horizontal velocity is constant, as mentioned, as shown by these lines here. And we know that the vertical velocity is accelerated because the yellow ball keeps path with the red ball. Okay, so now that we know the path of the projectile, let's look in a little bit more detail about an even trickier example of projectile motion. Here you see someone who's gone off of a jump. It's a motocross kind of event and he follows a path. Now we know that this is a projectile. Gravity would be acting downward on the biker and with minimal air resistance and of course no propulsion system this would be a projectile. Now maybe some of you are thinking, wait a minute, there is a propulsion system. There's the motor on the bike. You're right, but while the bike is in the air the motor is not providing any forward force because you have to be touching the ground obviously for that to happen. So here's a projectile where you're launched not horizontally, but you're actually launched at some velocity pointing above the horizontal. So we could call this the initial velocity. Here's a diagram showing you what's going on with an upward above the horizontal initial launch. The velocity is shown here, and it's pointing tangent to the curve. However, the velocity, just like back in this image here is made up of an x part and a y part. Here we've got the same thing. So they show you vy, which is an upward velocity, and vx, which is a sideways horizontal velocity. Now what have we learned? As time goes by, the x motion stays constant. vx is constant. So what I can do here is write in vx at a later time is the same length as it is here. Same with here, same with here, and same with here. However, Vy, the y velocity, is subject to gravity. And what happens when you are talking about gravity? Well, an object that initially started moving upward is going to be going upward not so fast a moment later. And then a moment later, it won't be going up as fast as it was the moment earlier. Eventually it'll stop going up and it'll start coming down. Now Vy is pointing downward and it's getting longer as the object falls back. If we add these two vectors together so that we take a tip-to-tail vector addition, we always get the tangent velocity that you see. First you see it drawn here. It's Vx plus Vy. Remember, connected at a right angle, tip-to-tail, gives you the instantaneous velocity right here. Here's the instantaneous velocity a moment later, a moment later, a little while later, and so on. So what we call these parts of the vector, the y part and the x part, we have a name for them. We call them components. Components is another word for parts, and so when you hear people talking about projectile motion, they will mention the y component. And, whoops, and the x component. Important to remember the x component is constant, the y component changes with gravity. Uh, at this point I realize I forgot one last thing on the last slide, I seem to be doing that a lot today. It's the fact of the video. I didn't mention what the fact of the video was on the previous slide, but now I am. I'm going to go back. Uh, what is the fact of the video? Well, the fact of the video is as follows. It's two parts to it. The horizontal velocity or the horizontal component is at a constant rate. 
and the vertical velocity is accelerated at 9.8. Those are the facts of the video. Together, they make up the facts of the video. Remember that for the quiz tomorrow when you come into class. All right. Anyway, so we've talked about this kind of projectile motion as well, and now we're going to begin to wrap up by talking briefly about the significance of projectile motion. And I can't stress this enough, there are some really important societal implications. One of them you see in this image here. This is a warship firing a projectile. You can just see it there. It's uh, a large bullet that's fired out of this gun. It would be called a shell by people who understand military affairs. Uh, not a very large shell as far as warships go, but still has enormous destructive power because it's moving so fast. Uh, when this shell gets into the air, it doesn't have a rocket engine attached to it, and therefore it's considered a projectile. There will be a lot of wind resistance, but there is no uh, propulsion system after being shot, therefore it's a projectile. I want you to think about what the significance of understanding projectile motion would be if you were, let's say, a military commander way back in the time when uh, matters of world significance were being determined. And of course, I'm thinking about warfare. Think back to early battles like in World War I or even further back when the technology for waging war was not as advanced as it was today. Can you imagine what an enormous advantage the Navy of a certain country would have if the engineers there and the scientists had mastered the art of projectile motion as it applies to warfare. You could very well win the war with this knowledge and this uh, technology, and therefore projectile motion has a very important historical significance. If you're a student of history or that interests you, you might want to look back at famous gun battles, tank battles, uh, naval battles of the past that have shaped world history. I don't want to leave you on um, a sad note of warfare, I want to leave you with uh, a more positive note. So now we'll look at something a little more uh, that we can relate to, and that would be sports. Here you see the game of American football. The player is about to throw the football. When he lets go of it, it will follow a path something like that, and of course it will be a projectile, and it will follow the rules that we've already discussed about projectile motion. There's an interesting thing that happens in football, actually. If you've ever watched this game, this ball has to be thrown to someone who's going to catch it, Preferably the guy on your team, who I see has been knocked down. Preferably not the guy on the other team who's going to intercept the ball. But anyway, thinking about the thrower here, who, by the way, is called the quarterback. Let's just write that in there. He's the quarterback. What are some of the thoughts going through his mind? He can throw the ball at a low angle, like this, and it may follow a path that looks something like that. Maybe his teammate will catch it. On the other hand, he could throw the ball at a high angle, and if he throws it hard enough, maybe his teammate will also catch it. In fact, as you're going to learn next year in grade 12 when we do more mathematics here, there's actually two launching angles. What I mean by launching angles is the angle above the horizontal that the player chooses to throw the ball. So. Here's a launch angle, and here is another launch angle, two different launch angles. There's a launch angle above the horizontal, two of them, that could actually lead to the same horizontal range. And so if you think about what this means, if you were a quarterback, for example, what angle would you choose? If you threw the ball really low, what are some of the pros and cons of choosing that angle? If you threw it really high, what are some of the pros and cons? Just to show you that I'm not making this up, here's an image here, which is very similar to the image over here. It's a strobe photograph that shows that indeed there are two angles whose range that you can see by this line here is the same. So why are there two angles that do this? I'll give you a hint, and I'm going to leave it to you to think further about this and then to discuss in class. If you look at the high launch angle, which I drew in blue, this one has a vertical velocity, a y velocity, like this, and an x velocity, like that. Let's label these in. This is vy, and this is vx. If you look at the red angle, <coughs> now you've got 
vx, oops, I didn't draw that very well, let's try again. You've got vx like that and vy like this. So my question to you, and I'm going to leave this to you to think about, we will discuss it further in class, is this. What effect does the x velocity have on the motion of both balls? And what effect does the y velocity have on the motion of both balls? I'll give you a hint. One of them helps you determine the range that the ball goes and how fast the rate at which that range is covered. And the other one helps to tell you about something called the hang time, the amount of time spent by the ball in the air. Which one controls which? And how could a quarterback use that knowledge to choose either the lower angle or the higher angle to reach his teammate who's running down the field and wants to catch the ball? It's an interesting sports problem that's especially important in the game of American football. And uh, one last thing, I promise this is it. There is a FET simulation that you should definitely check out on projectile motion. Here's what it looks like. It's a lot of fun to play with. You're given a cannon, which by the way, you can change the launch angle of, or you can change the launch height of. You can decide what sort of object you want to shoot. Oh, there we go. Let's, uh, when I was young, I played piano. Sometimes I did want to shoot my, I throw my piano out the window. I got frustrated with it. Uh, you can set the angle here or here. You can set the initial speed. You can set the mass of the object and its diameter. And you can decide whether you want air resistance included or not. You can even click on whether you want sound. Well, let's start with no sound, no air resistance and fire and see what happens. There goes my piano that I'm getting frustrated with and smashes on the ground. Uh, of course, these days I love piano. I wish I'd stick with it, but I didn't. Uh, let's try a golf ball. Let's launch a golf ball a little bit higher. Shoot that and see what happens. Hey, look, we get almost the same range. Maybe it's that idea that we were talking about a moment ago where there are multiple launch angles that can give you the same range, right? But my point is, Play around with this. For example, in that last one that I shot with a golf ball, now add in air resistance. What do you think would happen if there was air resistance? Make a prediction. Pause the video if you have to. Okay, you're back, and let's see. Did you predict that with air resistance, the ball wouldn't go as far? Well, you were right. Uh, change the altitude, meaning do you want to shoot down at sea level, zero, to zero meters above sea level? or way up in the mountains at 4,000 meters above sea level. What do you think would happen if you repeated this way up high in the mountains? Pause the video and think about it for a moment. Okay, here we go, let's test. And what do you know? The ball goes a little bit further. I wonder why that would be, that up in the mountains where the air is a bit thinner, the ball would go further. Really fun to play with this. Check it out. And folks, that's all I got for you today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in class.